All right, we're going to <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, <clears throat> open up with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we come thanking you for this day and thank you for this opportunity that we have to come before you and to hear what you have to say to us. God, we pray that you will be glorified in this place. I ask, Lord, that you will open up the hearts and the minds of your people as we get into your word. God, I pray that you will say the things to them that will help them in that spiritual growth and their walk with you. I pray, Lord, that you will answer questions that they may have had in their hearts, that you will open up their understanding, Lord, and so that they will be knowledgeable of your word and be able to apply it. God, we thank you for every soul that is here tonight. We ask that you will bless them, Lord, by opening their ears. I ask, Lord, that you will reveal yourself to them personally in a mighty way. Lord, that you will strengthen them as they continue to live for you, Lord. I pray also for the children that's here, that you will grab their attention, Lord, and not allow any distractions to take place, God. I pray also for those that are not feeling well in their bodies, that you will help them as well, Lord. Those that are fatigued, we come against every spirit that has been sent to cause distraction, to cause um, people not to pay attention. God, I pray that while you're speaking, that your spirit will go out among the people and bless them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come against every spirit that's not like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we want to say greetings to everyone and thank you all for being here. Thank you all so much for taking the time to come here and uh, join us in this fellowship. And uh, we're so grateful. Uh, also for those that are listening in and those that are watching us live, we're grateful that you are uh, able to attend however you're able to. Amen. All right, so now, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the second chapter of the book of John. Second chapter of the book of John, we're going to start reading at verse 13. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables. So I, I, want, I want you to picture this, uh, what's going on here. It says that the Jews' Passover was at hand. Of course, the Passover, uh, that was when they made sacrifices, honoring uh, what took place at the first Passover. Of course, I think you all know the story of that, that when they were in Egypt, the last plague that God sent was the death angel. And this death angel were, was passing over, uh, was, was going basically visiting all of the homes of the Egyptians, killing the firstborn of every home. Now, if you can imagine, that, that, that must have been a horrible time for people to wake up in the morning and see that their firstborn had been slave uh, in a whole nation and so in that they were told uh, the the Jews the Israelites were told to um, kill a lamb and they were told how to do it and so forth to drain the blood and to put the blood over the doorpost and when the angel saw the blood over the doorpost 
that he would um, pass over. And so that was set forth as a memorial to them. In other words, pass over and not judge that particular household. And that's where that come from. And so today, it's really the same concept with the blood of Jesus Christ that we have applied the blood. And I, I, I seem like I can remember somebody wanting to debate, to debate me about it, about, well, what does that mean to plead the blood? You know, I, where is that at in the Bible? Well, it's all over the Bible. If you read it, you see that. But if you, you'll miss it if you want to debate about it. You see that. But that's where pleading the blood comes from. In other words, applying it. You see that. Uh, it was not that the children of Israel were any more righteous than the Egyptians were. But they were God's chosen people. And so since God chose them, he was going to make provision for them. You see that. And so that's the way it is today. It's not that we're any better than anybody else, naturally so. But when the blood is applied to our lives, we become a different people. You see that? We, we become different. We act different. You see that? But it's not because we, we are so special to begin with. You see, God is not a respect of persons. But anybody who have applied the blood, what does God have respect for? The blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. You see that? That, that's, what he, that's what he respects. And so, during this Passover, they, they celebrated it every year. And, you know, just like anything, when it comes to God's word especially, today, things had changed from the original, uh, God's original meaning of it to what it had come to. And so, and that's why he sends prophets to help people come back to what he meant and, and what the original purpose was. And so just like anything, God creates something and is good and then men come in and corrupt it with their own ideals. And so what was that corruption? It's got some folks that they don't want to travel that far or whatever the case may be, whatever sacrifice they have. So we're going to sell them sacrifices in the temple. Now, it wasn't that God was against people buying oxen and sheep and things like that, especially if they didn't raise them for themselves. What he was against was it being done in his house. And he's still against that today. Except today it's not oxen and sheep, it's books and tapes and CDs. Let's look at that again. Verse 13, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and who? The changers of money. <clears throat> what were they doing sitting? Verse 15, And when he had made a scourge of small cards. Now I want you to picture that down. He's just like a parent. Come in from working all day, see the house all in an uproar, not going to say anything to you. I'm just going to go get my switch and I'm going to shock you. <laughs> now, it took him a few minutes to make this scourge of cords. It wasn't just one hanging on the door handle like, you know, it was in our day. He had to braid this thing and put it together. In the meantime, they just clueless, still selling it. Praise the Lord, Jesus is here. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time he's thinking I'm about to I'm about to make the news <laughs> they think they don't like me you wait till I get done this day you see so there he is braiding this cord together and what did he do it says he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the table see that so it wasn't just the sheep and the oxen, in other words, the books and the CDs, I don't like you changing money in here. In other words, exchanging. You buying stuff in the house of the Lord. That's not God's will. You see that? That's not God's will. You'll never make me understand how somebody can say, the Lord told me to write a book or to preach a message and I'm putting it on CD, but I'm going to sell to you what God gave me. Amen. 
Now, if you if if you want to go the route of selling it, don't say God gave it to you. And if God didn't give it to you, we probably don't have any business buying it to begin with. So you see that you just there's just no way around that. It, it, it's too many different avenues, and people say, "Well, it costs money to do this, or it costs money to you know." You, you can write a book and put it online, and people can read it online. <coughs> Or I'll put it in PDF format and they can do that. I do like what we do when we preach a message. We just put it on on uh, the blogs and put it on our website and anybody can go and download them. If you just want to have a copy to play in your car or whatever. So it's got too many avenues for it not to be done the right way. But there are preachers today, you know, if they see their message on YouTube and they didn't put it up, they writing YouTube about it, flagging your account. And that shows you what kind of, and can say, you know, in their own little commercials, well, you know, God gave me this and you need to buy this. Or you need, you know, this is important for the body of Christ. It must not be too important if <coughs> folks can't get it for free. You see that? So, there's no way around it. And so we see in what, what God's mind was about this. If you want to know the mind of God, you just pay attention to his son and see how his son acted. So you imagine today some preacher going into a church somewhere doing this very same thing. The Lord didn't have anything to do with building this temple. So it wasn't like he was in charge of it. He would go in every Sabbath day and, and teach there. But he wasn't in charge of that temple. He had nothing to do with that temple. And yet here he is cleaning house. You see that. Alright, so let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 16 says, And said unto them, That soul doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Everybody see that? Now that's, that's clear as day. Now he meant what he said. And that don't mean... We got the church upstairs and the basement downstairs and we can sell in the basement. Because you know some of them do that as well. They're going you know, to try to find a way around God's word. What he's talking about is don't make God's business a business. Amen. That's what he's saying there. Don't turn this into something that is not supposed to be. All right, and then some preachers say, well, they were cheating. You don't read anything about them cheating anybody. It, cheating, had they could have been giving them good deals. Those oxen and sheep could have been on sale. It wouldn't have mattered to the Lord. <laughs> no matter what kind of coupons you had. So let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 17, and his disciples remembered that it was written. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. In other words, he was aggravated about it. Mm -hmm. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, saying if thou doest these things? Everybody see that? In other words, we want you to prove to us you got the right to do this. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 19, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days... I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. <coughs> when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, let me just pause right here. Let me read that again, and then we're going to look at something just real briefly. It says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So this is almost three years later. His disciples remembered what he had said after he had been risen from the dead. Now what was, what was the issue there? If you remember what we learn about the swords and the saw, it talks about how the word of God is planted. Some of it on good ground, some of it on stony ground. 
and, and, and thorns and thistles and things like that. And, it, and, and of course the first one is the devil comes, the word of God is planted, but the devil comes and takes that which is planted. Why? So that later on, when you're supposed to believe what you heard some years ago, is not there anymore. You don't, so it's not there for you to even believe. So if the disciples had been living a compromised life where they heard the word of God and they heard God speak the, the way Jesus was speaking here, if they had just been living their own life and, and not sanctified, that word would have been taken from them and they wouldn't have believed it when they saw it come to pass. You see that? And, and th now that is what makes some believers live from pillar to post. Does everybody understand? They're not living off a of daily bread. They're living page from paycheck to paycheck spiritually. Wanting God to reveal something to them, but he's already revealed it. It's just the enemy have come and taken that from you. And now you, you're, you're panicking, wanting God to come and reveal something. And, and it doesn't matter if you do it. Until you remove all those distractions out of your life, you're just wasting your time. It doesn't matter how hard God preached. God can come down and set you in his lap. You still won't believe it because the word has been taken from you because of the distractions that you have. So we read in verse 22, it says, When therefore he was risen from the dead... His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. Everybody see that? You can't remember nothing as long as you got all kind of other stuff going on. You know, some of you, you got enough sense, naturally so, not to have three and four conversations at a time, at the same time. But so you want to hear from God. But you you got too many other stuff, too much other stuff going on, and and God's not going to talk over, you know, you or your best friend on your phone or the television program that you're watching. He's not going to do any of that. It doesn't do him any good, and you either. So you got to learn to be still and be quiet. And I'm telling you, that's something hard for people to do nowadays. Some people, it, it just drives them crazy for it to be quiet anywhere. You, you can't even get in your car without turning your music on. And I don't care if it's gospel music. That God's not going to talk through that. God said preach the gospel. He didn't say anything about singing. Everybody understand? So you may think, well, God excuses it because this is gospel music. But I, I, now I like gospel music just like anybody else. But I know when God want to talk, I need to I need to turn some stuff off. Doesn't matter if I if you pin gospel on it or not. You see, you still need to get quiet and, and get still. Now, if you wanna if you wanna see this and the spiritual warfare that goes on at its very root, you just purpose in your heart to get somewhere and be still and pray. Now that's where you see it in in the raw. Somebody's going to call. Somebody's going to ring your doorbell. Folks that ain't talked to you in years, they're wanting to reconcile. <laughs> what is it? It's the enemy. And you may think, well, you know, this is a blessing. This person's doing this. Or that. But, you know, <clears throat> just because that person that's ringing your doorbell is saved don't mean that the enemy's not, not behind that. Everybody understand? You have to learn to be still. And I know, you know, there are people that, that call me on a regular basis wanting to talk. And, and sometimes I don't answer my phone right away because I'm trying to hear from the Lord. So everybody else just have to take a back seat to what the Lord want to talk to me about. You see that? And, and then I get around to it, you know, and, and things like that. And so, but that's where believers are today. Don't want to be quiet. Don't want to be still. Even in the children, restless. Headphones on all the time. Why do you think the devil wants you blasting stuff in your ears all the time? Even if it's gospel music, why do you think the devil wants you having something going on all the time? 
You, you can read in the Old Testament. There was a time when Moses, God called Moses up to the mountain. And Moses got up there and for 40 days he sat there until the Lord spoke to him. For 40 days. And today we, we can't stand that for 40 minutes. You see, we, we can't stand that for 40 minutes, you see. And so the Lord wants us to learn to be still. You see that? Learn, he wants us to learn to get to a quiet place. And that don't mean falling asleep. Because <laughs> that, that's another thing that comes upon people. You, you can wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning and set your mind, I'm going to seek the Lord from 9 to 10 or whatever. 9 o'clock, you're sleeping. And you know, and you, you can't blame your, your body for it. Because you'll stay awake for something that you're enjoying. <coughs> Folks will stay up for days doing what they enjoy doing. You'll make time for what it is you want to do. <laughs> and so if, if you fall under that umbrella, then what you have to ask yourself is, what is it on the inside of me that I can't delight myself in the Lord? And I'll tell you why your prayers aren't being answered. You see that? You, you delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. It says delight. It don't say ask. It says delight yourself in Him. Some of you have heard me tell this story. Uh, one of my daughters, when she was, I guess, about four years old, uh, I would get up. Back then, it was my thing. I would get up at about uh, six o'clock in the morning. And I would just go to my office and pray and and read and things like that. And uh, so I, I, I'd be up by myself in there. And so one day she got up with me and she came in my office and I was just sitting there. Uh, and she pulled up my the office, another chair that was in there, and pulled it up right next to me and just put her head in my side. And so, of course, you know, the first thing you think is, okay, what do you want? Mm -hmm. So that's what I asked. I said, so tell you, what do you want? She said, nothing. I just enjoy being with you. And so then I began to ask her, so what do you want? Do you want ice cream? <laughs> Why? But I was pleased that she just, that she was coming to me, not because she wanted anything, but because she just enjoyed my presence. I, I began to think of stuff I could give to her. Amen. And so right after that, now the reason why I'm telling this is because right after that, the Lord spoke to me and said, now you see, that's the way I am with my people. If they learn to come to me and just enjoy my presence instead of having their hand out, just begging all the time, Amen. I give them what they desire. I already know what they desire. Amen. But you've heard me say this before, you're not going to pimp God. You're not going to act like you like him and snuggle up to him just until you get what you want. Amen. He knows your hearts. Ain't no use in you trying to, you know, he's not the average girl or boy on the street that ain't never been around the block. He already knows what people are up to, whether you say it or not. Even if you got yourself fooled, he's not fooled about you. So in other words, you can't go at God sideways. So, so in your heart, if you know that you have not got to that place to, to desire Him and where you can delight yourself in Him, you need to get there. And you need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, what's wrong with me that I, I can't even take out an hour in my day to delight myself in you, to hear from you? It's 24 hours in a day. What are you doing? What is it that's got your time spent? You see that? And people say all the time, oh, this day went by fast. And the devil wanted, wants you to think. The day, let me tell you something. The Lord don't speed up days. Why does the day go by fast? Because you're busy. <laughs> doing everything but what you should be doing. That, the, God does not speed up days. Yeah. I'm not living in yesterday and you're in today and somebody else in next week. <laughs> 
So a slow day for one person may be a fast day for another. What is the difference? Now, if you got a secular job, you know what I'm talking about. If you bored, you just sitting there watching the clock. This day going by slow. No, it's not going by slow. You need to earn your money. <laughs> do what you're getting paid to do. <laughs> All right, so let's let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 22. It says, and therefore he was risen from the dead. His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture, and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Everybody see that? Now I want you to pay close attention to that, what that says there. Verse 24. Well, let's, let's start back at verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Commit himself unto who? The people that believed. When they saw the miracles. Now in that is a whole nother lesson. The same thing what he tell Thomas. You believe because you saw. Blessed are those that believe and see not. Uh, you know. I've never seen the holes in Jesus' hands. Apparently they're still there. I guess we'll get to sin when we get to heaven. But I believe he died for me. And that's what we're going to get to here. In just a little bit. He said, blessed are those that believe and see not. In other words, it didn't take them seeing to believe. Why? What's the difference? Faith. If you can see it, it don't, it don't take faith. And I'm telling you, it, there's so many believers that have, a, that have a hard time living by faith. But you're supposed to live by faith. You're supposed to walk by faith. Mm -hmm. Now you don't get very far in God not walking by faith. How can you even say that you believe it exists except by faith? Alright, verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. Everybody see that? And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Everybody see that? In other words, Jesus Christ was not gullible. And he don't expect us to be. He didn't... He, he, this Bible says that he did not commit himself unto people. Now many, many of us you know, we're so fleshly. We just be so happy when somebody believe in us and all of that. That wasn't the Lord. And the Bible says he knew what was in men, so he didn't commit himself unto them. He knew how fickle men could be. So let me just give you an example. How many of you remember when, um, what was that, Candy Crush was all the craze? How many of y'all still playing it? That's what I thought. <laughs> Y'all see what I mean? People are fad-minded. Back in the 70s, bell bottoms were in. Back in the 80s, everybody was rolling their jeans and rolling them up to tighten up the legs. Because if you had bell bottoms, people were going to tease you. In the 2000s and late 90s, bell bottoms came back. This is after a whole lot of folks got depressed from being teased about them. And so it's hard for us to grasp that because we're living in the moment. But you think about it. God's been living since living was available. 
So he saw, he sees all of the fads, he sees all of that, so he knows how fickle people can be. And it just, you know, even more personally, you know, uh, people will be your friend as long as you're doing what they want you to do. You're the best friend in the world as long as you're doing what I want you to do. Uh, but as soon as I see you got your own mind, I got a problem. Fickle. You see that? And, and so you find out what's in people. You just stick around. You see. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So he was one of the people standing around believing because of what he saw. We know, in other words, he was saying, we know that you have to come from God to be able to do the miracles that you're doing. All right, so let's go ahead and keep reading. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now that's, that is what we're basing this message on. God wants you to be born again. Now that's, that's something that people have a problem with. You hardly ever hear a message preached on being born again. People's, people will say that they are saved because that's a safer word. You can say that you're saved because in your mind you may feel like you have grasped a hold of salvation. But you take it to a whole different level when you're talking about being born again. Because when you claim that you've been born again, that means that you're different now. Amen. You're, moving be from, you're moving beyond being saved by grace. And, that's, and people love to grasp that. I'm saved by grace. Which you are saved by grace. But let me make this clear. Grace is not a license to sin. Amen. In the Bible, the word license is translated as lasciviousness. <clears throat> Some of you have read that in the Bible and may not have known what that meant. It means license. So the Bible talks about that. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words... Thinking that grace is there for you to just keep doing what you've been doing. So when the Bible talks about grace and having grace, and we'll get to that later on, and you know, in this, in in uh, as we continue with this series here, when the Bible talks about grace and grace abounding, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It's talking about God giving you the grace to live right. The same way he may have graced Michael Jordan to play basketball. So when you talk about grace, you're talking about gifted. So we look at different children. They can maybe play an instrument without needing as much instruction as some other child or whatever. And we can say that child is gifted. What we're really saying is they are graced. And so when you are living, when you are born again and you're living a righteous life, people ought to be saying the same thing about you. <clears throat> You got grace. Not because you are doing what you're big and bad enough to do and getting away with it. <coughs> but because something on the inside of you is causing you to live a right life above, a righteous life above what the world can do. Amen. That's why Jesus said what he said. Except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. You got to go beyond self-righteousness. You see that? That comes from being born again. So, verse 3, let's read that again. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <coughs> Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
What does the water represent? I'm not talking about being baptized. Everybody understand that? It's not talking about a natural baptism. Being born of the water is receiving the truth of God's word. And, and you read that in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. You see that. You read that in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians about the husband washing his wife by the watering or with the watering of the word. In other words, she's receiving truth. And because she's receiving truth from her husband, it's causing her to live a righteous life. And so Jesus here, when he says, except a man be born of water, he's talking about being born of truth. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Everybody see that? Now, what does it mean? Now, he's not talking about going to heaven. Or he would have said the kingdom of heaven. Now, you notice that you, you read that through the New Testament, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven and, and all of that. The kingdom of heaven is just that, heaven. The kingdom of God is not only heaven, but the earth. In other words, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is displayed in this earth. Amen. You see that? And so he's saying that if, if you cannot, if you have not been born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. And that's the reason why many people don't see it today. You see that? Because they have not been born again. Now, how did he say two things? Been born of water and spirit. Water meaning you've heard the word, the true word, and it's been preached and you believe it. The spirit meaning after you have believed what you've heard, then the spirit of God comes on the inside of you and causes you to live right. Amen. <clears throat> so what is the problem with today's church? What is the problem now? Why didn't God allow Jesus Christ to be born by the will of man? In other words, Mary was a righteous woman. And Joseph must have been halfway decent himself to even believe that a woman could conceive by the Spirit of God. Now, what you think? Now, that's, that's a hard one. If you got a husband or a boyfriend, you just come home pregnant and... and, 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 and Convince him that God is the daddy. He had to believe that. So Jesus Christ was not born by the will of man. He was born by the will of God. Well, why didn't God just allow him to be born by the will of man? Because he came here. And that, that was God's purpose for that. He came here born after the spirit he in other words he came here what we would call born again not after the will of flesh you see that in other words mom and daddy didn't get together and have a nice night and he'd show up ten months later he came by the will of God you see so let's read that again verse 5 Verily, verily, I say unto, you, unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. So, it, it is impossible. And let me make this very clear. It is impossible for people to be born again if they have not heard the truth. Mm -hmm. you, you can't be in a false church where preachers are not preaching the truth and say you're born again. Amen. Impossible. Jesus just said that which is born of flesh is flesh. And, and, and that is part of the problem that we have today. It, there are so many people who come to the truth. Maybe they become a part of this ministry or somebody else's ministry where God is preaching the truth and they go in there thinking that they're saved already 
but ain't ain't but have not heard the truth to even get saved. You can only be saved if you've heard the truth. You can only be born again Amen. if you've heard the truth. So let me make this clear. What goes on with, with people being born again? For somebody to want to be born again, you have to be convinced that the life you're living now is not good. It, it takes a God sent preacher to make you understand it doesn't matter how many houses and cars you own, you on your way to hell. And so a lot of people are not born again because they have not yet denied their former life. Still, the reason why so many so-called professing believers are still the same is because they have not been born again. They don't see anything wrong with their life. And let me make this clear. There's a big difference between being born again and just changing some things in your life that you see don't line up with the Word of God. Amen. Big difference. You may go to a church and you can hear the word and you can say, okay, yeah, I can see that. Lord, help me with this. Lord, help me with that. When really, you just need to be born again. The reason why people always falling back in sin is because they've never been born again. That spirit of God is there to, to nullify the deeds of the flesh. It's there to kill that flesh. And the reason why folks have a problem with the word of God is because they have not accepted it to begin with. You see that? And you can't be born again if you have not accepted the word of God. It doesn't matter how harsh it comes across. It is meant to, to bruise you. If, if the word of God is hurting your flesh, it's because flesh is still alive. Now, you need to know that. You see that? You need to know that. And so the Lord wants you to be born again. But that means admitting and confessing that the life you are living now is no good. That means denying yourself. And that's what Jesus tells us. If you, for you to come take up your cross and follow him, you have to first deny yourself. If you are born again, you're not going to have the same friends you had before you were saved. Now somebody compromises somewhere, and I know it's not the devil. The devil don't he don't compromise. He 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 don't he don't try to play safe. He's the devil straight up and down. And so if, if you can still identify with folks out in the world who you were running with before you were so called saved, you need to be born again. Because I don't care how close you were out there in the world, the devil recognizes what belongs to him and what doesn't. And, and he and he, the devil don't want to have fellowship with light. So if the light's on the inside of you, why do you want to have fellowship with darkness? Except darkness is still there. I tell you, it's, it's more to salvation than well. Praise the Lord! I heard a good message on backbiting, so I'm gonna try to change that up. <laughs> You, you can go to a ministry for years preaching the truth and if you don't decide to be born again you're just as lost. All you're doing yeah. is playing this game of oh I heard a good message so I'm going to try to hurry up and fix this and then by the time you get 10, 10 months down the road you're back in the same mess you were in before. Why? Because you haven't been born again. you just hearing messages and trying to change yourself. But the Spirit of God is what quickens us. Amen. If you've been, if you've heard the truth and you have accepted the truth, that's what invites the Spirit of God to live on the inside of you, and that's what causes you to live right. It's not in your own strength. Amen. Jesus said, "You must be born again." So let me make this clear. What what did he say? That which is born after flesh is flesh. That which is born after the spirit is spirit. In other words, now after you've been born again, God opens your eyes and you're able to see things the way that you couldn't see them before. Amen. You begin to see, I really was on my way to hell. 
I really was walking in darkness. You see that? You begin to see all of that. And, and you, you really thank God for pulling you out of what you were in. But they see, that's after you've been born again. And let me make this clear. When you love God, in other words, it's not burdensome for you to keep His commandments. You don't have a whole list of things up and down your wall of things that you need to work on. My uh, father, my daddy, he passed away when I was six. And so I didn't know very much about him. You know, how I many of you, you don't think much about that kind of thing when you're six. You, you know, when I was growing up, I wasn't thinking he was going to leave. So I just felt like we got a whole lifetime to get to know one another better. Even though he was living in the house with all of us, you know, at the age of six, you're not thinking that your parents are going anywhere. So I didn't observe a lot about him. I was just concerned with what most six year olds are concerned with playing and having as many toys as I can have, I guess. And so after he died, you know, as, as I began to get older, people would tell me different things. And they would say, not just the fact that I looked like him, which was obvious, but some of my mannerisms, the things that he did, things that I, I don't ever recall seeing him do, I just did them. That showed me, you see that, that it's just some things, when you're somebody's child, it's just some things that you inherit. Mm -hmm. I got this thing I do, my, my, my wife have told me about it, that, you know, that my daddy used to do. When I get sleepy, I may, I just put my hand on my head and she'll be saying, you about to go to sleep. I said, no, no I'm, I'm up. What you, what you want? You want to watch something? You want to, what you want to do? I said, no, you get to sleep because you're doing exactly. And I got a picture of my daddy with his hand on his head. But I never paid attention to that. So I'm saying it's not something that you have to watch. Now, if that's the truth, naturally. So that I picked up so many things from him or uh, that I act like him, even things that I didn't see. How much more so spiritually if we're born again? Shouldn't we act like God? Amen. <coughs> we should be like Him. And Jesus tells us that in the book of Matthew. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father. Even as your Father in heaven is perfect. It says be perfect like Brother Jones or Brother James. It says be perfect like God. Amen. And, and that goes for people that's walking around preaching that lie. Nobody's perfect. The devil got all kind of doctrine out there. If Jesus tells you to do it, he expects you to do it. No, you're not perfect if you're not born again. And I'm going to tell you, you want to see a frustrated person? You just look at that one that's claiming to be saved but ain't been born again. Yeah, you living a hard life. And some people just get to the point where they just throw up their hands because it's too hard. Listen, it... It's not hard to be like your daddy when you've been born after him. Amen. It's not hard to live for God. If you've been born again, you see that? And so that's God's will. God wants us to be born again. So let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is what? Spirit. Now that's all day long. If you're born after the flesh, now you know if you're born after the Spirit, because if you are, you're going to be led by the Spirit of God. It's not going to be, it's some things that you didn't have the power to do before you got saved, now you got the power to do it. God, listen, God don't have a 12-step program. He's not AA or anything like that. And it amazes me how many programs mankind have set in place to do what only God can do. It's folks that want to stop smoking. I don't care how many patches you buy and put all over your body. 
that spirit will be back if you ain't born again. Everybody understand? You you can't you can't live the life of the spirit that the spirit of God gives you without that spirit. You may try to imitate it, but it won't last long. But if you're born again, you're gonna live like you're born again. That which is born after the flesh is flesh. You, you ever notice? I don't hardly make a pool for people. I, I believe this when they ask the disciples in the book of Acts, what must we do to be saved? What did, what did they say? Repent and be baptized. He didn't say, come on down here and let me lead you in a sinner's prayer. Amen. No, I'm not leading you. I don't know what you've been doing. I can't repent for you. I don't know your business. So what do, what do I look like going before the Lord, you know, with all of that? I'm not, I don't lead people in a sinner's prayer. If if you don't feel compelled to confess your sins, you're not ready to be saved. That's right. That's why I don't do that. That's your decision, not mine. You see that? that that's your decision. My prayer is that you get saved and become born again. But if your repentance is on you, and what do people repent from? Their sins. How do they know that it's sin? Because some preacher have laid it out for them that you need to be born again. You you need to hate what you were doing. As long as you are liking, I, I tell you, and, and that's why I see I'm I'm careful with what I share concerning my past because I'm born again and I don't find pleasure in it. I don't care how good it sounds to the world. I'm embarrassed by the things I used to do. Amen. But some folks, uh, they love, and after they get saved, uh, they want to go back and take a trip down memory lane of all the stuff. And that shows you ain't come out of it. You're still trying to glorify in it. Glorify in that mess. There's something still on the inside of you that want to hold on to that. That's not God's will. We, we, we're supposed to loathe the things that we've done in our past. That's what makes us want to get born again. We want to leave all of that behind. It don't mean that we don't share our testimony and what God has brought us from. But don't you, don't you make one mistake in thinking, you know, that that's a testimony when you're really bragging about it. <laughs> Alright, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 7. says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Everybody see that? And he's telling us how that Spirit come. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, that ought to wake people up. About this doctrine that you're not saved until you speak in tongues. I, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe every last one of them are still for today. I believe people ought to speak in tongues. I believe people ought to interpret tongues. But speaking in tongues is not your sign that you are saved. Amen. Let's read that again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Everybody see that? The disciples spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost. But you can't say that that was the day they got saved. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible makes it clear that that and, and people and people say, well, except unless you get saved like they got saved, you're not saved. If you don't speak in tongues the way they did, you're not saved. I don't know this far, so let's just let's go real quick to the book of Acts. Let's go look at that.
the second chapter of the book of Acts. We're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it did what? Now I've been in churches where people have spoken in tongues. I've never seen a cloven tongue like fire come sit on anybody. So you can't say, unless you get saved and speak in tongues the way that they did, that you're not saved. Or that people are not saved. Why did the devil start that doctrine? Because he wanted to give people false confidence in gifts rather than living a holy, clean life before the Lord. Jesus warned us of that in the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew. He said, many in that day will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not cast out devils and done many wonderful works in your name? He said, I'm going to tell them, depart from me, ye that work of iniquity. I never knew you. So here were people, according to what Jesus said, they're going to come to him with the gifts. Trying to qualify themselves. And he's going to tell them, your gifts don't get you into heaven. So you have to know that. That's the reason why it's called a gift. It's not nothing that you earn. You see that? And so he's telling us how a person is born again. You can't pinpoint it with uh, uh, the Spirit of God moving like that. At this time, of the, uh, at the day of Pentecost, Jesus had already went back to heaven. There was nowhere around. Went back to heaven. But you can read in the Gospels, after he rose from the dead, the Bible says, he blew on his disciples and said, Receive ye the Spirit of God. How many of you read that? Everybody see that? We don't read anything about them speaking in tongues then. When did they receive the Spirit of God? When he blew on them. So gifts is not a substitute for being born again. Amen. If it didn't work for Judas, it's not going to work for you. Amen. God wants you to be born again. What is amazing to me how many people in church today put so much emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit but can't stand the Word of God that the Spirit wrote. There's something wrong with that. You see that? So God wants you to be born again. That's where that newness of life comes in at. That's where it comes in at. That's what makes you start living right. That's what makes you accept God's Word. That's what helps you to change? God is not a laundry list God. He's not a law God. In other words, Amen. you become born again, you're going to act like Him. That, now that settles that. Amen. If you become born again, you're going to start acting like Him. <coughs> That's God's desire. He wants you to be born into the kingdom of God. That's why we don't do memberships here in this ministry. We don't invite people to come, you know, put your name on the roll, anything like that. You can't. The Bible don't say anything about joining church. You're born into it. You see that? You're born into it. And that's God's will. Amen. All right. We'll go ahead now and open it up for questions or comments.
Yes. Are you talking about people who see and believe and people who like they see and all that stuff? But I just wanted to know like what happens what's what about people who see but don't believe? Then worse shape. If they if they see if they see and don't believe, it's because there's a spirit there that's blocking them from believing. But in reality, there are really only two kind of people, non-believers and believers. A person that has to see to believe, eventually the devil will talk them out of believing what they've even seen. And that's why it's important that we <clears throat> walk by faith. Because you, you can pray to the Lord and say, Lord, if you just give me a sign or do this, the Lord will give you all kinds of signs, and then next week you'll be asking for another sign. It, it won't satisfy you. So somebody that has to see to believe, that's only temporary. Eventually you'll get to the point where you don't even believe what you saw. You see, and so that's, does that answer your question? <laughs> and I, you, you, you know, and that's 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 the way it is. God wants us to 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 believe in His word, and you know, and to live by faith, to walk by faith, and just just believe it when He tells us or what we read in His word. You see that? But if you, again, you can, God can show you all kind of signs, and you, it still won't be enough. You know. It, it'll last you for a little bit and then after a while that's gone and you need another sign. You see, what did, what did Jesus say when they said, show us a sign? He said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and will only be given one. The sign of Jonah. You see that? In other words, what? Something that happened years ago. That's your sign. And so a lot of people walk around today asking the Lord for a sign and God have already given it. What you need to do is ask the Lord, help me to believe what, I already, what you've already said to me. <coughs> a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You see that? In other words, if you can't believe without seeing, it's something that's there that should not be there. It's something that's there that should not be there. And so you just need to get right with the Lord <coughs> when that's the case. My wife and I, when we got married, I believe when we got married that she loved me. So I don't wake up every day asking her to give me a sign. You see that? You just, and, and listen, and I... I I tell you, uh, people believe what they want to believe. Now, here's the thing about it. it, it this is not a one-sided thing. It's got two sides to it. The one side, you can believe what God say. And take him at his word. Without him having to turn down here and do cartwheels to show you. Or, you believe in the devil. It's either or. Now, by default, if you don't believe God, you automatically believe in an evil report. You see what I mean? Automatically, you believe in evil report. You think about it. Let's just use sickness. People say, you know, by his stripes, we're healed. Now, that's, that's Bible. By his stripes, we are healed. You can believe that. Or, you can believe the opposite. But isn't, there's no middle ground. You're going to either believe God or the devil. There is no, I don't believe anything. You believe something. So if you don't believe the word of God about by his stripes we were healed, then you believe the doctor's report and what the devil got them seeing on the x-ray. So <coughs> by default, if you don't believe God and what he said in his word, you automatically be the, believe the devil. You see that? And a lot of times it's just what people have been trained to do. I believe it when I see it. I believe you when I see it, and that's not God's will. Amen. My question to you is, if you like that, how you know you're saved? 
Where did you see salvation at? I ain't never seen it. Where can you buy it at? What store do they sell it at? What does it look like? It don't look like anything. But I believe Jesus Christ died for me and I see the fruit of it. I'm not waiting on God to change me and then I believe, oh, you are real. I used to do this and now I don't do it anymore. No, I believe that God is real. I believe that he changed me and because I believe he changed me, I'm changed. Amen. That's how it works. A lot of people waiting for God to come in and do something and then they're going to believe it. You know, if God, that, that, that's the way faith works. It believes it before it sees it. Believing it is what brings it to this natural realm. Amen. So you can feel bad in your body and you can just stay in bed all day and say, well, when I start feeling better, I'll get up. And the devil's sitting right there with you saying, I'm glad you've got that doctrine because I'm going to make sure you don't ever get up. When you believe God and His Word, you up. There ain't no use in you saying you believe the Lord and you still laying around sick like, you know, or, or whatever. You believe it. You believe that you're healed first. And, and that's, that's when it comes. You see that? You believe that you're healed first. And I, I even in marriage, I, like I said, this whole world is based on I believe it when I see it. <coughs> Back in the Bible days, they were doing what we call arranged marriages. But really what it was, people were praying and asking the Lord who they were supposed to be with, and that's who they were with. And they didn't have to fall head over heels for them. They see, now that's, that's, that's believing after you see it. I believe you're supposed to, I'm the person that you're the person I'm supposed to be with. Why? Because you made me fall in love with you. We done hung out and we done did all of this. That's not the way God did it. In God's word, God said, now this is the one you're supposed to be with. That's why in the Bible, when people got married, they, it took them a year and God uh, commanded the men to, to take a year off from their job, basically to cause their wife to fall in love with them. So the love came after marriage. That cloud nine love, everybody understand? Mm -hmm. That's the way God did it. People weren't courting for a whole year to try each other out to see if it was going to work. No, they got on their face before the Lord and prayed about who they were supposed to be with. And once they figured that out, that's who they were with. So because people have learned today to walk by sight, I got to fall in love with you now before I actually want to be with you or before I commit my entire, the rest of my life to you, because people choose to be that way, as soon as they quote unquote fall out of love, it's easy to get a divorce. Because why? They walk in by sight to begin with. Faith says, you know, I didn't have to fall in love with you to be with you to begin with, so it's not going to be me being on cloud nine all the time to keep me with you. Now that's the way God does it. So the reason why so many divorces today is because people walking by sight. I don't feel the way I felt when we first got married. <laughs> well, whose fault is that? First of all, no, you, you make a decision. You make a choice. The same way I'm telling you, you choose who you love. Those little cloud nine and butterfly feelings, that's all going to dissolve. Uh, You're going to see that. That's just in a do-rag and rollers. <laughs> you got to look, you got to learn to look beyond that. And that's why people get into relationship after relationship, looking for something that you know that's that's a no end to it you find the person that God has for you and that's who you're going to be with that's who God desires for you to be with it don't take you getting to know a person and I got to see if we have the same likes and desires and that's walking by faith 
You get somebody that's too much like you, you ain't going to like them. You're supposed to be with somebody that's different than you to help balance you. Who are, who are you balancing? You see that if you're with somebody that's exactly like you. Nobody. You ain't, ain't nobody balanced. Y'all both way off in left field. And somebody got to be in right field so y'all can come together in, in the middle somewhere. That's why it takes walking by faith. You, you read about the story with, with Isaac and Rebecca. God revealed that that was his bride. And got married. And stayed married. You see that? It wasn't when hard times came and she tried to pull this stuff with Esau and Jacob that we just had it out and we had to go to Dr. Phil to get counseling. No, they stayed together. Why? Because God ordained it. And that's what happens when you walk by faith. You see that? You, you, you'll be with that person because God ordained it. Not because of how ugly of a mood you woke, in, woke up in one morning. All right. <laughs> Do we have any other questions or comments? Questions or comments? All right, if we don't have any other questions or comments, um, we just want to say again thank you all for being here today. We thank God for you all uh, making the drive of this, and uh, we're just grateful that you all were able to come out and share with us this evening. All right, if that's all now, we're going to dismiss you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.